lovely to be with you folks again today. I'm so blessed. And, and I want to share my screen with you. Let's just make sure that you can see it. Everybody can see the screen. It's starting well. Yeah. Yes. It's there. T today I want to share about eternity. This is such an important topic. And, and I'm so blessed that the scriptures you've been reading this morning, um, those are the exact scriptures that the Lord has given me to share with you, Philip. That was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Eternity. It's so special to us. We're going to take our scripture reading this morning from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. And uh, oh, just hold on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Chapter 16 from verses 19 to 31. And there are two reasons for the message that I want to share with you this morning. The first reason that I'm sharing this message is because I want to motivate us to take as many people to heaven with us as possible. You know, we've brought nothing into this world. We can take nothing out. And the only thing that we can take to heaven is people or people. Mm -hmm. So I want, I want us, as we read the scripture and look at what it's saying, I want us to motivate us to share the gospel as much as we possibly can. Amen. And then the second reason I want to share this particular message, I felt the Lord give it to me during the week, because I want to encourage us to get excited about our stunning eternal future. You know, this COVID thing and this lockdown has got us depressed sometimes and miserable and negative often, all the things that are happening around us. But I want to encourage us today to get excited about our stunning future and the things God has got for us. And so the story in Luke chapter 16, it's a story about two men. Yeah. And you know, you always have the before and after pictures. Mm -hmm. Every time I go to the butcher, I, I see this picture of these two guys before and after. And <laughs> before you see these two guys, they've just got a, a shorts, running shorts on, and you can see they've, they've puffed out their chests and, they, and then they're looking really fat and their hair's untidy, and that's the before picture. And then you look at the after picture and you see them holding in their stomachs and, you know, very taut like this and their hair is nice and and that's the after picture after they've been on this diet and I think you know these photographs are so photoshopped but there is a before and an after picture for all of us in eternity we're living in the before now and there's an after to come so let's have a look at the before of the rich man and Lazarus and we'll pick up a few things about them Jesus was telling a story I think it was a testimony really he said there was a certain rich man. And I don't think this was just a made up story because he was very particular about it. He said there was the certain rich man. And, and you get the feeling that he knew exactly who this man was and that the people who were listening to him telling the story also knew exactly who that man was. And we learned something about this man in his before life. He was clothed in purple and linen. He was obviously very um, popular around town. He was a somebody and he fed sumptuously every day. He enjoyed his food, you know, all the food that would be delivered to his residence. You could see it coming on the on, on his trailers or on donkeys or however they brought them and he ate well. He ate really well. Rob, if you think your bread is great, you want to see what the rich man had every single day. He had bread just like you wouldn't believe. And at the same time, while he was in his beautiful, magnificent, palatial home, Jesus said there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. And you also get the feeling that everybody knew who this man was. And he said, this man, Lazarus, he, he was a thin, sickly little man, and he would lie at the gate of this rich man. Now, can you imagine if you were in your home and every day when you opened the gate to guard in your car, there was this beggar lying at your gate, looking sick, full of sores and, and dogs coming to him and licking his sores. I, I don't think you'd be very impressed. You would think, I wish he'd go away. Well, why doesn't somebody take him to a home or something? Why do I have to see this poor man here at my gate every single day? Wouldn't you feel like that? You'd be irritated, like sometimes we're irritated with beggars 
in the streets, who, who hobbling along and, and really putting it on just to get money. And he was irritated with this man. I'm very sure he was because he, he was a sight for sore eyes outside his palatial mansions. And as we look at this man, we saw he was full of sores. And when he saw all the food arriving at the rich man's house, and when he saw all the rubbish bags coming out with all the leftover food, he just wished that he could have some of the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. But there was something else about these two men that we're going to discover as we look at this story. The rich man didn't go to heaven, we're going to find out, not because he was rich, lots of rich people go to heaven, but because he didn't have Jesus as his savior. And we're going to find out that he knew the gospel, but he rejected it. The big, big on the other hand, although he was suffering in this life, he knew the Lord. And so when he died, he went to heaven. There's a dash that marks the transition that makes all the difference. The day of your birth and the day of your death is separated by a dash. And that dash represents our lives. And whether we go to heaven or we don't go to heaven is focused on that dash. We have to believe the gospel and we have to receive Christ. Revelation 3.20 says this, as many as received him. At John 1 verse 12 rather says, as many as received him. To them, he gave the power to become the children of God. Revelation 3.20 says that the Lord stands at the door of our heart and he knocks. And if we open the door and receive him, then he will enter in and we will become born again. And this was the difference between these two men. I, I really believe they both knew Jesus and sat under his ministry. They heard him on the streets of Jerusalem. But one received him and one didn't. You know, there are a lot of people who believe the gospel but they believe with their head and there's an 18 inch difference to your heart. I once had a very good friend, his name was Malcolm. He grew up in Eton College from the age of four years old. He was a Lord, he was a very highfalutin guy. And then he got saved and he came to Durban and we became very, very good friends. We often had breakfast together and we shared a lot of stuff. We prayed a lot together. And one day I was in Morningside and his flat was close by and I thought, I've got an hour to spare. I'm here early. What I'll do is I'll pop in and see Malcolm quickly. And so I was right there by his flat. So I ran up the stairs. I knocked on his door and he opened the door in consternation. And he said, I didn't invite you to come to my home today. He said, this is a British thing. I, I, said, I don't know about you British folk, but he said, this is a British thing. You don't come to somebody's home unless they invite you. And he shut the door in my face. And we were good friends. We believed in each other, but he never received me that morning. Next door were some South African friends. I knocked on their door and they said, oh, come in, have some coffee. And we had a great time there. And he was never very apologetic about that. He said, that's how British people are. And so here we find that this beggar died. And, and look what happened to him. The Bible says that he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. I have another friend who tells me I'm not afraid of dying, but I'm afraid that I'll never find heaven. You don't have to worry about that. The minute you die, the minute you move out of your body and leave your tent behind, there are going to be angels who are going to escort you into the presence of God. You leave your body behind, you go to be with the Lord. And on the day of the rapture, your body will be raised from the earth. The dead in Christ shall rise first, your dead bodies, you reunited to your spirit, and we who are alive and remain will together be changed into our resurrection bodies. So that's a wonderful testimony. This digger died and he was carried by the angels. His dash meant that he touched the Lord. But the rich man also died and he was buried. No angels. The Bible just dismisses him. He was buried. You know, rich Jews are, are very generous many times and, and they give a lot of money to the temple. I'm, I'm, I'm sure the synagogue, I'm sure this man gave lots of money. He did good deeds. He was well known around town. People must have flocked to his funeral. He must have had a huge funeral while the beggar was probably picked up by the local dump truck and dumped into into some rubbish place somewhere where they, where they bury dead bodies of paupers. But this rich man had this amazing funeral. And you know what? When he woke up after he left this earth, he wasn't in an, amaz an amazing place. I was visiting Scotland once. I was with Ferguson Joe and we were on a ministry tour. 
And down the road from where we were staying, they took me to this place of this rich man. Remember that, Fergus? This rich man. Just down the road from this, this thing that you're seeing here, he had this huge plot with a wall around it, all cemented, and there's his tombstone, a magnificent tombstone. He obviously had an amazing funeral, and the whole of town knew him. He was a man who was rich. He was a businessman. He was a merchant, and uh, some people tell us that his life wasn't that nice. He didn't treat his family very well, but nevertheless, this rich man had this magnificent grave right outside his house. You can go there today and see his house, and there it is, but just outside that wall, there's a little stone and somebody put a plaque there and here's some unknown believer, just an unknown nobody who was buried. And it just reminded me so much of Lazarus and the rich man. What people say, how much money you've got, how much pomp and ceremony there is at your funeral means nothing if you don't know the Lord. And it was amazing to see a modern replica of that story. Oops. I have to stop doing that. Three things that people discover after they die. And we will discover that too. They're just three things. One is that physical death is, the, is in this life opens the gateway or the doorway to eternity. When we leave this life, we enter eternity. Two, that there are only two eternal destinations. Jesus said there's a broad way and a narrow way. Most people, if you ask them, say they're going to heaven. But Jesus said the majority of people are going down that broad way to eternal destruction. And he said there are only a few that find the narrow road and end up in heaven. And how grateful we must be to the Lord for that, that we found Jesus. And the third thing people discover after they die is that the destination we choose lasts forever. And there's no second chance to change our mind. Once we leave the earth, that's it. We go to one of two destinations. So there is a heaven to gain and there is a hell to shun. So the first thing I want to say is that should be our motivation to win the lost. If we think about their eternal future, if they don't know the Lord, it's a terrible, terrible future and we don't want them to go there. We don't want them to be lost. We don't want that to happen. And so may this message today motivate us to start asking God to give us a passion for souls. Because we read that the rich man also died. The Bible says he was just buried. And being in torments in Hades, when he opened his eyes, it's like falling asleep in this life and opening in the next. The minute this man opened his eyes, he found himself in a place called Hades. And there he found himself in a terrible torment. And he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abram afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. That, that in the normal English Bible there, there are lots of words for, for the place of departed spirits in Greek and Hebrew because they're very precise languages. Mm -hmm. Like there are lots of words for love. You know, there's uh, eros, erotica love, and there's philia, the love of God. But the English Bible translates them all love. And the English Bible takes these words, Hades and Sheol, and translates them all hell. And let me just give you a quick preview of what the words mean. Sheol Hades is a place of departed, unsaved spirits. You could call it the holding cell of hell. It's where the dead who don't know the Lord go and wait for their judgments, for their day of judgment. That's called Sheol Hades, the place of departed spirits. There's, there's another word the Bible trans, the English Bible translates as hell. It's the Greek word is Tartarus. And that's a special place where the fallen angels go while they're waiting for the great day of judgment. And then there's another word that English Bible translates hell, and that's Gehenna. And that is the final hell, the lake of fire and brimstone. I know that there are people who have written books and talking about hell, and they go in vision to hell. Folks, hell isn't open yet. Hell will only be opened after the great white throne judgment. And we read that the Antichrist and the false prophet and Satan himself will be thrown into hell. That's still to come in the meantime, the people who are not saved are held in Sheol Hades, which is the place of departed spirits. You could call it the, hell, the holding cell of hell. And then we find Lazarus and he's in, he's in uh, Abram's bosom. Abram's bosom and paradise are the same thing. It's the present home of the saved. 
So if you know someone who's rejected the Lord, and I want to say this as well, we can't say whether somebody's gone to Sheol Hades or to paradise. We don't know. You know the rich, the guy on the cross, the thief on the cross? If you told his, his family that he went to paradise with Jesus, they would have laughed at you. He was a thief. He was a murderer. He was a bad guy. But at the last moment of his life, in his last breath, he acknowledged Jesus. And the Lord said, today, you will be with me in paradise. So we can never say, unless somebody in their dying breath rejects Jesus and goes into hell cursing God, then we know that they're not saved and they've gone to hell. But you can never comment on anybody. We have to believe that the judge of all the earth knows the right thing. And, and so we don't comment but we do have to tell people they stand that chance of ending up in that place if they don't receive Jesus. So let's follow the rich man. Let's see what he experienced in Sheol Hades. You notice in verse 23 that he was tormented. He suffered terrible torment, agony. We notice that he could see. He wasn't just a, a blob. He wasn't unconscious. He wasn't sleeping in the grave. As some people say, when you die, you sleep in the grave. He was very much alive. He could see. He saw Abram afar off. And you know what the worst thing for him was? He saw Abram and Lazarus afar off. He found himself separated from God and from believers for all eternity. We should be motivated, folks, to share the gospel with people because that is their future if they don't know Jesus. Separated from God for all eternity. We notice he could speak because he cried out. And he spoke, he said, Father Abram, have mercy on me. He said, you know what, send Lazarus so that he can dip the tip of his finger in water and come here and cool my tongue. For years, he'd ridden past a a Lazarus and wished that Lazarus would die or someone would take him away. He wouldn't even give him a crumb. And now he's asking Abram and saying, please, just send Lazarus. Just send him to me. And let him bring some water because it's so hot here. The flames of hell, he realized the flames of hell are real and they're not a myth. People say you make your own hell on earth. Folks, the worst experience you can have on earth is nothing compared to the hell that Jesus spoke about. And he spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. Abram said to him, Lord, he said, son, remember. He could remember how good his life on earth was. He could remember everything about his life. He could remember the poor beggar at his gate. That's why he he remembered his name. And I think he thought of all the men on earth, he was heaven bound. He was rich. He was Jewish. He was a leader. He was important. He had the big funeral. Of all people on earth, he should be in heaven. But being rich or famous doesn't make you a target for heaven. You have to be born again. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus and then Abraham said the sad thing to me said no no I'm I'm sorry there's a great gulf fixed you are in this place Sheol Hades the holding cell of hell you you're waiting for your judgment you're waiting for your court case you'll be cast into hell there is no communication with the dead notice that those who want to pass from here to you cannot Lazarus can't get to you you can't get to him the people on earth can't get to Lazarus and Lazarus can't get to earth do you know that when you communicate or try to communicate with the dead you're getting involved in spiritism and God hates that Deuteronomy 18 10 notice this anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire that is he sacrifices their children to Satan like abortion, those who practice witchcraft, a soothsayer is a fortune teller, those who interpret omens, you know, glossy, glossy, or, you know, how many children am I going to have, and read your poems, and read your timelines, those are soothsayers, sorcerers, those who conjure spells, or a medium, spiritist medium, or a spiritist, or those who try to call up the dead, all those who do these things, the Lord says they're an abomination to me. There's no communication between the living and the dead. There's a great gulf fixed. Don't let anyone ever tell you different. That's what the Lord says. And this is why I say that this man, I believe, knew Jesus or heard Jesus. Because suddenly he understood that the gospel was enough to keep him out of heaven. And he said, I beg you for that. If you can't send Lazarus here, please send Lazarus to my father's house. 
I've got five brothers there. I just want him to go and testify. I just want him to go there and talk to them and tell them about the gospel. Tell them about Jesus so that they don't come to this place of torment. And Abram said, he said, they've got Moses and the prophets. They've got the Bible. Let them hear the prophets. Let them read the Bible. He said, no, you know, people don't read the Bible anymore. But if someone comes back from the dead and tells them, then they'll believe and they'll get saved. And Abram said, no, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Isn't that true? The world knows that Jesus Christ died and rose again, and they're still not persuaded. So this is why. We must get a passion for the loss. This is why we must win the loss at any cost. That rich man, as you and I are sitting here today at the Zoom meeting, he's still in Sheol Hades, the holding cell of hell. He's still waiting for his trial at the great white throne judgment. He rejected the gospel in his life. Now he will pay through eternity for his own sinful state and rebellion because he rejected Jesus' payment for his sin. And after his great white throne judgment, he will find himself eternally in hell, Gehenna, separated from God forever. The man who started the Salvation Army, uh, I think his name was William Booth. He said, I wish I could take all of my workers and dangle them over hell just for five seconds. And that would be enough to give them a passion for souls. Folks, we need to win the lost. It's so exciting for me to see what Fergus and the team are doing, that they're going out there snatching people and transferring them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of life. We need a passion for souls. Because hell has got no fire escape. There's no second chance. That's it. Jesus said two destinations, the broad way leading to hell or the narrow way leading to heaven. There is a heaven to gain. And there is a hell to shun. So now I want us to get excited about heaven. I want us to get motivated so that we never, ever feel like getting up. We learn a few things about Lazarus. One is that when he died, the angels took him to Abram's bosom. God's got angels taking care of us. The Bible says that the angels are ministering spirits to the air of salvation. I experienced that when we nearly got hijacked. An angel saved us in the hijacking situation. You know that the devil took a third of the angels, but he left two thirds of the angels serving God. And so for every bad angel, there are two good ones. And we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. So we know this on earth, that, that God is looking after us and he's going to look after us for all eternity. And we know that when Lazarus made it to heaven, he was comforted. He was encouraged. He was excited to be there. We've got such a wonderful future ahead of us. I want us to become excited today because I want to share seven things that Lazarus discovered about heaven and that you and I will discover when we get there. First of all, that death is the doorway to heaven. The minute he died, the angels took him to Abram's bosom to paradise to where the Lord is. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are confident, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and present, sleeping in the grave, waiting for the, for, the, for, for the Lord to come in the grave. No, absent from the body and present with the Lord. Jenny Cassie is absent from the body. She's present with the Lord. What an amazing future we've got ahead of us. Don't get discouraged. Don't say, I want to give up. You know, the, the Egyptians and the Israelites, when they left Egypt and things weren't going their way, they said, oh, we, I wish, let's go back. Let's just forget about this fellow Moses and let's go back to Egypt. Don't even think about going back and giving up because there's such an incredible future waiting for us. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Paul wrote in Philippians, he said, for me to live is Christ. It's wonderful to walk with the Lord and have fellowship with him, but to die that is gain. He said, I'm, I'm so hard pressed. I've got this, this problem. I, I you know, want to go to heaven, but I want to stay and look after you. He said, I have this desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. When I got saved, I, I saw a vision really of a tombstone. And as I looked at that tombstone, it became an archway and it was full of this light. And I can see it as I speak to you today, this light so drew me and I knew that was the gateway to heaven. Folks, when we die, absent from the body, present with the Lord, we depart to be with Christ, which is far better. Isn't that exciting? Paul said, paradise is heaven is a literal place. That's the second thing we discover. 
death is the doorway to eternity, but etern heaven is a literal place. Paul said he was caught up into paradise, and there he heard words he couldn't even share. It was so amazing. The Lord says to him who overcomes, he's speaking to the church, to believers, I will give to each from the tree of life the paradise of God. That's our destiny. It's a city. Abram waited for a city with foundations. We're not going to float around in heaven. You know, before I got saved, I thought we were going to be like a little gray cloud floating around the earth, the heaven somewhere. No, we're going to a city whose maker is God. It's and, and this city, heaven, is in heaven. Heaven is a heavenly country. And our city, the great beautiful Jerusalem, is situated in the country of heaven, and that's our future. Who would want to give up and go back to Egypt? Where's heaven? People ask about heaven. Do you know the Bible speaks about three heavens? First of all, there's the atmospheric heaven. That's the place of stars and planets. We look out on the atmospheric heaven. And then there's outer space. And beyond that is the heaven of heavens where the throne of God is. And, and, and David said, who's able to build the Lord a temple since heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Heaven is a real place. It's a literal place. Where is it? People laugh at us sometimes. We say heaven's up there. And they say, okay, the world's a globe and heaven's up there. But the guys at the bottom here, they're saying heaven's up there and they're pointing down. You know where heaven is? The Bible tells us on the further sides of the north. No matter where you are, heaven's north. Heaven's north, that is in Isaiah 14, 13. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king, Psalm 48, verse 2. Verse two. The third thing this man discovered, he discovered death was a gateway to eternity. He discovered that heaven was a literal place. And the most wonderful thing he discovered was heaven was going to be his dwelling place forever. No one was ever, ever going to hijack him again. No one was ever going to, to get him out of heaven. He was there forever. That's what Psalm 23 verse 6 says. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. The Lord's going to stay with me. But afterwards, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's the most wonderful, wonderful thing to know. So what's heaven like? I've heard people say, you know, I don't want to go to heaven. It's going to be so boring. I don't want to sit in a cloud and play a harp all day. I want to go where my friends are, where there's excitement. Have you heard people say that? I once saw a, 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 a clip, a news clip of, a, of the tunnel, the channel, and there was a train in there that had caught fire, and, and the people were running down the tracks to get out to the, the safety areas because of the thick smoke. I tell you, none of them thought it would be fun to sit in that train in the middle of that smoke, in the middle of that fire and share their holiday photos. They were running for their life. Folks, we don't want to go to hell. We don't want to end up in that place. Heaven is a place of pleasure and great joy. God loves beautiful things. He makes tiny little fish and he puts them in the bottom of the sea that we haven't even seen yet. But everything is so beautiful. It's a place of pleasure and great joy. Psalm 17, 5, as for me, I'm going to see your face in righteousness. And you know what? When I get to heaven, I'm going to be satisfied. When I wake up in my eyes in heaven, I'm going to be so satisfied. It's a wonderful, beautiful place. He wrote in Psalm 73, verse 25, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's none upon earth that I desire beside you. He says, God, you fulfilled my greatest desire. You know, some people are never satisfied. We once took a group to Israel, and we were staying in five-star hotels. Israel was in the middle of war, and, and, and they were very nice hotels. And this chap came along, and he said, but this is so basic. I paid all this money, and yeah, I'm staying in these so-called five-star hotel. He said, he said, this is terrible. I want to go and stay in a Lani hotel. Folks, heaven is better than you could ever desire. When you get to heaven, you're not going to say, oh, okay, so this is heaven. You're going to say, wow, it's a place of pleasure and great, great joy. Psalm 16, the psalmist wrote, he said, you'll show me the path of life. And he said, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. When you get to heaven, you're going to be so happy. You're going to be so joyful. I once went to a funeral where um, 
the pastor of the church that I was uh, serving in, his daughter died. She, she, she was about 18 years old and she died. And we were at the funeral and they opened the coffin and, and he went, uh, he, his wife took a rose and put it on, on their daughter. And then he laid hands on her and he commanded her to rise from the dead. I said it was the scariest moment of my whole life. I, I was almost standing on my seat thinking, will she rise from the dead or won't she? Did, she didn't. She didn't. But I said to him afterwards, don't you ever do that. If you do my funeral, do not try to raise me from the dead. I don't want to come back to this place. Heaven's a beautiful place. It's a place that's Whoa. fullness of joy. There are pleasures forevermore. It's a wonderful place. I don't want to come back here. I don't know about you. I know we, we miss our loved ones. We wish they were back here for us. But folks, rather wish that the day would come when you could be there to share the glories of heaven with them. It's a wonderful place. Another thing he discovered, that he wasn't sleeping in the grave, but he was fully and absolutely alive. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, now we see through a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, also as I also am known. He said, they're going to know me. When I get to heaven, I'm going to know people and they're going to know me. You're going to walk up to Daniel and say, hey, Daniel, I read your book. It was wonderful that you wrote all those things down. You're going to recognize Abram and Isaac and Jacob. You're going to recognize your friends and your family that have gone ahead of you. You're going to know them and you're going to be known by them. It's a wonderful place and you're going to be fully and absolutely alive, absent from the body, present with the Lord. You just leave your body down here for a time and God's going to get gather those atoms together, whether they've been burnt or cremated or shock ate them or whatever. He's going to gather those atoms together and he's going to transform them into a beautiful new body that's fit to live in heaven. Concerning the dead, the Lord says he's the God of the dead. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Those who've gone on are fully and absolutely alive and they're happy in heaven. And those who rejected the Lord, I'm sorry, but they're not happy where they are with, in Sheol Hades where the rich man sadly found himself. So what are you going to do in heaven? You're going to sit on a, sit on a cloud and, and uh, you know, play your harp? Are you going to wander around and look at all the beautiful things God, God's made? Remember, God's a creator. He didn't just create this earth and stop creating. He's creating universes and, and all sorts of things that he'll be creating throughout eternity. And, and we're going to be enjoying all these things. Heaven's a place of activity. There's lots of angels there. They're busy bringing in all the people, all the believers who died. They're escorting them to heaven. The little children... The Lord says they have got angels. When you, when the minute you're born, God assigns an angel to you, reports to the throne. These angels are coming and going and bringing reports. And then John says, I looked into heaven. I saw a great multitude. There were people there of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues. And they were all crying out to the loud voice. And there were angels and there were living creatures. And he said, they were all there, this huge multitude. And they were worshiping God. They were worshiping God. He said, it's a place of activity. It's a place of music. It's a place of beauty. It's busy, 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 busy. So what are you going to be doing in eternity? What are we going to be doing in heaven? The Lord said to one of his servants, he said, well done, good and faithful servants. He said, you were faithful over a few things. Now I'm going to make you ruler over many things. The Lord said, I was training you on earth to fulfill the tasks that I've got for you in heaven. And because you were faithful and you did it and you accepted my preparation and you worked with me, now I can give you many, many more things to take care of in heaven. You know, there are going to be rewards at, at, at the judgment seat of Christ. And, and maybe we're going to lose some rewards because we weren't faithful in the few things God gave us to do. And maybe there are going to be some things in heaven we won't be able to do because we were so slack here on earth. The Lord says, serve me with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. And then if you look at that, Fergus, maybe you're thinking, oh, no. You're going to make me rule over many things. I want to rest up a little. The Lord says, no, enter into the joy of your Lord. These things are going to be wonderful. You're not going to drag around this old body anymore, but you're going to have a resurrection body and you're going to have energy and you're going to have life and you're going to have joy and you're going to enjoy everything that I'm preparing you for. You're going to reign with him. 
you're going to reign of all the things God has created. You're going to reign with him. And you know what? Right now, God is preparing us for this very thing. Right now, the tasks he's giving us to do. Right now, the things, the, the gifts that he's put into us and, and that we're developing, he's preparing us for this very thing. If we use our gifts, we're going to use them in heaven. Use your musical gifts. Use, use your people gifts. Use your counseling gifts. Use your cooking gifts. Use your, all the gifts he's given you because you've been prepared for an incredible future in heaven. And the Lord says he guarantees that future by the Holy Spirit. And so I want to end with this, that heaven is a magnificently beautiful place. Paul said he was caught up into paradise. Beautiful. When you look at heaven, God uses the best things that we appreciate so much, and it's going to be better than this. Talk about jasper and gold and precious stones and emeralds and sapphires. Heaven's going to be even more beautiful than that. I heard about a man. He was saved. And he was quite a mean man. He lived a very frugal life and he made his family live a very frugal life. And when he died, they discovered he had enormous riches that he'd been hiding away and burying. And, you know, they enjoyed spending it afterwards. But while he was on earth, um, he, he just didn't enjoy his own wealth. And someone imagined his wife said, I bet you when he got to heaven, he said, Lord, why didn't you let me take all these things? I spent my whole life, all this gold I've got. Why didn't you let me take it to heaven? And she said, I imagined the Lord opening the gate and saying, look at the streets they're made of gold, man. Why do you want to bring paving stones to heaven? We don't need all this stuff. The wealth God gives us, let us use it. And, and let us use it to grow the kingdom of God. And this is the best thing about heaven. Nothing unclean, nothing that's a liar or that's fraud, nothing unclean or that defiles is going to enter to heaven. The only people that are going to be found in heaven, Jesus said, are those on the narrow road. And he talks about them in the scripture, Revelation 21 verse 27, only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The minute we receive Jesus as our savior, our names are in that Lamb's book of life. In fact, I believe your names are there from the day you're born. But when you reject the Lord, he takes your name out. He told Moses said, you know, Lord, take my name out, but leave the Israelites in. The Lord said, no, Moses, your name stays. But those who reject me, I take their name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. And they end up in that holding cell of hell waiting for the great day of judgment. Nothing evil in heaven. No more hijackers. No more thieves. No more liars. No more fraud. No more anger, no more irritation, no more pain, nothing that defiles. Folks, our future is incredible. It's better than running the Comrades Marathon and getting a gold medallion and a Coca-Cola towel. It's far better than that. You're never going to hunger or thirst again. The sun's not going to strike you. The heat's not going to drive you crazy. And Jesus, who walks with us here on earth, He's going to be right there in the midst of us and he's going to continue to be our shepherd. Isn't that wonderful? He's not going to abandon us and say, okay, now you're in heaven, get on with it. He's going to continue to shepherd us and lead us and guide us. We, we're going to drink at the everlasting fountains and all that pain that we've experienced here on earth, God's going to wipe away every tear and you're never going to be depressed again. You're never going to be sad again. Heaven's a wonderful, magnificent place. In fact, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it says, but it is written, eye hasn't seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. You can't even imagine what heaven's like. A Jewish man wrote once wrote about a woman who was pregnant with twins. And, and he, he wrote in this book, and it really impressed me. The one twin said to the other, they said, you know, I wonder what it's going to be like when, when our mother gives birth to us. And the one twin said, well, it's going to be like this, just like what we used to, a womb with lots of water, only bigger. Another one said, no, no, it's not going to be like this. It's going to be better. There's going to be music and color and, and we're going to do things and experience things and meet people and, and, and we're going to, it's going to be wonderful. Another twin said, oh, you're dreaming. It's going to be like this, only bigger. Folks, heaven is not going to be like earth, only bigger. It's going to be fantastic and wonderful. And that's your future and that's mine. And so share the gospel. Bring people to this place that you're going to. 
So what have we considered today? Today we've considered the fact that death is the doorway to eternity. We thought about the fact that heaven and hell are both literal places. They're real. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life go to heaven. No matter how many good deeds you've done, no matter what you believe, unless you believe with your heart as well as your head, it's no good. We found out that heaven is a place of pleasure and joy in the presence of the Lord. We're going to be fully alive in eternity from the moment we leave this earth. We're going to be fully alive. We found out that heaven's going to be a place of activity. You're not going to be bored. It's going to be a wonderful place. And we found that our future is a magnificent, beautiful place. And with that in mind, can I encourage us today, in the midst of any trial that you have, let us keep on keeping on. Because John wrote and he said, beloved, now we're the children of God. We call the children of God now. But you know what? It hasn't yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he's revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Think about the person that you dislike the most. You don't hate anybody, okay? You're a Christian. But think about the person that irritates you the most. You got that person in your mind? He's a believer. But when you see him coming down the aisle of the church, you, you go down the other aisle. And you, he phones you. You don't answer the phone. You got that person in mind? Do you know that believer that irritates you? The minute he reaches heaven, the minute the, the rapture happens and we receive our resurrection bodies, he's going to be so glorious and so magnificent and so beautiful that if he could walk through your doorway right now, you'd be tempted to fall down and worship him. We've got an incredible future ahead of us. We're going to be like Jesus, beautiful and magnificent in our resurrection bodies. We won't be God, but we'll look like Jesus. And so everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself because he's pure. So if we know this is our future, folks, don't give up. Keep on keeping on. Get close to Jesus and keep pure and keep ready for that great moment when the trumpet sounds and we meet the Lord in the air. Amen. Amen. God bless you and thank you for, for listening. Fergus, I give it back to you. Thank you, Val. Can you um, unmute that? No, I can't unmute oh. everybody else. Is okay. Thanks, Val. You stop the recording. <coughs> That's what I mean.